Welcome to our session today. Um, this session is actually crucial if you're building with generative AI. And I've been speaking with a lot of customers today, and every customer was asking me one question. And it was always, I want to build with Gen AI. Which model do I really choose? And this is what we're going to walk you through today. My name is Aris, and I'm joined here on stage by my dear colleague Roy. We are both AI ML specialist solutions architects with AWS. So as I said, model choice, which model to pick, we're going to walk you through that journey alongside an example use case of enterprise scale. We are focusing on enterprise scale. We're going to start with potentially hundreds of thousands of models that we have, right? And we're going to think about first how, how, how we can nail down that selection into a handful of models. Then we're going to speak about alignment approaches. How, we, how can we tailor these models to our specific use case requirements? before we then delve into evaluation strategies. Evaluation strategies that now are not experimental, but st well, strategic, um, automated, and at scale. And we're going to point out how Amazon Bedrock is supporting you on that journey alongside the way. Now, Gen AI is still a big hype topic, right? Um, nobody knows exactly where we are in the hype cycle. But what is certain is that 2023 was the year of POCs with Gen AI. I'm pretty sure there is no one here in the room which has not had one POC with Gen AI in this organization. Now, moving on into 2024 and towards mid-end of the year, 2025, it's going to be crucial to bring these things into production because we actually want to harness the business value, right? And what we have learned in the last one and a half years is actually that a lot of you are operating in organizations with multiple business units impacted. You have dozens of different product and engineering teams working on these solutions, and you're usually not only looking into a, you know, a single use case, you're looking into hundreds of different use cases with potentially you know, hundreds of thousands, if not even millions of people affected either internally or externally. And with that, a couple of requirements are arising. We said you need to scale. You have these small POCs that you get started with, and then you're scaling out, you go to production with millions of users. So you need to have flexible consumption models, and you need to have scaling inference. Plug and play is important because we are still early in the game. New models are getting out in the market you know, almost every day. And also, your organizations are still adapting to the requirements of you know, that new generative AI or AI world in general. A couple of you know, design patterns have been popping up during the last one and a half years concerned with bringing your data to the model or to the application, namely a reg or fine tuning. And you are seeking for solutions to do that in an easy way. Then task orchestration can be a topic if you're having more complex tasks, and that happens in business. And obviously, all of that needs to happen in a space where your data remains private and secure. And we've taken all of these requirements and built them as key components into Amazon Bedrock, the easiest way to build with generative AI on AWS. And these are also the reasons why any company has decided to build with Bedrock in the Gen AI space. Any company is a large enterprise in Germany, in the German market, distributing consumer goods. They have multiple business units, as we said. They are working with multiple um, product and engineering teams. And they are looking into multiple use cases from domains like question answering, summarization, entity extractions, and a lot more. Now, we won't have the time to focus on all of, different, all of these different use cases today, but we can certainly look deeper into one specific one. And this is going to be question answering, a pretty popular one. And the most popular approach to question answering is actually the classical chatbot, the multi-turn question answering, just because we human beings are conversational species. So let's assume you're the lead architect of any company. And you want to build a chatbot for the customers of any company that they can use to inform themselves about the products of any company. Which model would you pick? Now, luckily, you start with a great selection of different models, cutting edge from leading foundation model providers that you can choose and plug and play. Amongst them, AI21 Labs, Anthropic, Cohere, and Mistral but also Meta, Stability, and our own Amazon models. Now, with that broad selection, you need to do a first sub-selection to get started, right? So how can you really select a subset of these models 
to look a bit closer which characteristics um, are out there uh, to do that. Roy, please introduce us to them. Thank you, Aris. So, as Aris has mentioned, we offer a wide selection of foundation models on Bedrock in order to enable you to develop your generative AI applications. These models have different capabilities, thus it's crucial to understand their properties to select the right model for your use case. To understand this, we group the properties into two main categories, the intrinsic properties, which refer to the core or inherent traits of the model that are determined during the initial training and the model design phase. These include the technique used to train the model, the size of the model, and the underlying network architecture. They impact the model capacity, which is the overall ability of the model to learn and represent complex relationships and patterns from data. On the other hand, we have the user-facing properties, and these impact the model's practical usage from an application perspective. They thus define the end user experience, and they include the supported use cases, supported languages, if you're working in a multilingual domain, the model's context size, how we can customize the model, and most importantly, the performance and the price performance trade-off. So let's dive into the first intrinsic property, which is the training technique. This entails the methods that are used to steer or customize your model towards specific use cases or objectives beyond the initial training. So we typically start with a pre-trained model where we train a base model on a large text corpora in an unsupervised manner. This enables the base model to have broad capabilities across a wide range of tasks. Thus, it can be further fine-tuned using supervised data for downstream tasks. An example of this is where we can instruction tune the base model by providing a carefully curated data set that comprises of instructions paired with the desired outputs. This enables the model to understand and follow instructions, thus making it suitable for applications like task automation and workflows. You can further fine tune this for dialogue adaptation or chart adaptation by fine tuning the model with dialogue data. Thus, it can engage in natural and contextual conversations useful for your chatbots and virtual assistants. Lastly, we can align the model with human preferences va like values by ensuring that the models are helpful, honest, and harmless by using techniques such as RHLF and DPO. This enables the models to be used in use cases such as content moderation and filtering. The next intrinsic property is the, the size of the model. So this is usually represented by the number of parameters. And the more the parameters, the larger the model capacity. Well, uh, the model size will give us a rough indication of the model um, like its capabilities, but it is not a measure of the model's performance. And this is because recent research has shown that smaller models can outperform the larger models when trained on higher quality data and better architectures. The model providers may give relative size descriptors to show the size of the model, such as Titan Large, Mistral Large, and uh, similar models. The size of the model is important because the larger models require more compute resources to train and deploy compared to the smaller models. The last intrinsic property is the architecture of the model that impacts the, its capabilities and performance. Here we look at, um, we know that most LLMs are trained on the transformer decoder architecture, which is widely adapted and offers good performance. However, there is room for optimization in the space complexity. Thus, we are seeing new and emergent architectures such as the mixture of experts, where you have several expert subnetworks um, to reduce the compute space by routing the input token to specific experts. You also have other novel, like, uh, like, like, you know, like approaches such as the, the, like the straight space models and the RNNs with the weighted key values that also aim to optimize the compute efficiency. Thus, the architecture is important because it impacts your model scalability, the parallelism, the throughput latency, and the overall performance. And now that we've looked at the intrinsic properties, let's shift gears to cover the user-facing properties that define the end user experience. For these, we will start by looking at the supported use cases. So some models support several um, 
like domains such as the summarization and, and question answering and chatbots and so on. And this is because they are trained on a diverse, vast data that enables them to excel at these broad capabilities. However, there are cases where we require domain expertise and high accuracy, and this is where we have the domain-specific LLMs. Such use cases include drug discovery, the protein folding, and credit scoring, and thus we need to adapt the models for these specific domains. By adapting the models for the domains, it enables us to customize the end user experience, and the domain-adapted models, because they are fine-tuned from the base model, they will have both the broad capabilities of the base model together with the domain expertise from the domain data. So most of our customers are also operating globally and thus have multilingual users. And thus it's important that these models are able to understand and generate text across multiple languages. This is important for customization and localization, together with compliance where some institutions are required to offer services in a specific language. If you have a multilingual use case, it's important to look at the model benchmark cards to see the performance of the model across the language tasks that you are addressing. Beyond the supported, um, we and, the, and beyond these languages, we also support the code generation across different tools. So this enables the flexibility in application dev and, the in, uh, and to work with the applications. So by having this, you, you're also able to work with unsupported data formats or structured like, 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 the, data for, like, the, like, the, like the data formats such as JSON um, and XML in order to parse the input and outputs when ingesting and presenting data to your customers. The next user-facing property is the model's context size. So this refers to the maximum input sequence length that the model can handle. It can typically range from 4,000 K, fr like from 4K to 200K worth of tokens. And this, uh, the larger the context size, this will enable us to handle large document li like the processing by passing the longer text for multi-page documents. Um, it, the large context size will also enable us to experiment with the complex prompt engineering like approaches because we have a larger context from the input prompt. While the larger context size are desired, they are not a measure of the model's performance. They actually impact the latency and throughput, and thus we need to evaluate carefully based on the context size and our use case. You also can evaluate approaches that enable you to extend the context size limit of the model beyond the initial training, such as ROPE, that enables you to accomplish this. And if you are working in a specific domain, like we mentioned, you will need to customize your model for this domain. What are the key considerations that we look at in this approach? First, we look at the data, the quality, and the amount of data that you have will determine the customization approach that you will take here, together with the task at hand. For, and for example, for code generation, we will use a base model that is a code generation for a start. And based on these two factors, there are various fine-tuning approaches. You can do the continuous pre-training with unlabeled data, or the supervised like fine-tuning with, with, like with the labeled data, or align the models if you have the preference data for this. There are optimal approaches that enable you to fine-tune or adapt the model with significantly less data and significantly less compute requirements, such as the parameter-efficient fine-tuning with LoRa. And this is recommended as a start, where if you have less data and you are limited on the compute, then you should explore this parameter efficient fine tuning for your use case. And lastly, the other key property is the overall performance of the model. There are various factors that impact the, like the performance of the model, and we need to evaluate each of these based on our, on our user requirement. So to highlight a few of these, we have the throughput, which is the number of tokens processed per second. This is a key metric for offline applications. On the other hand, you have the latency, which is the um, time taken to generate each token. And this is crucial for real-time applications such as chatbots and virtual assistants. Thus, based on your use case, you need to optimize for either throughput or latency or strike a balance between both. Together with this, you have the accuracy, which is the measure of the quality of the model's outputs. 
And we need to have a reliable evaluation framework to compare the outputs from the different like models that we are evaluating in order to select the right model for our use case. We will look at this in more detail in the coming slides. And there is often a trade-off between the model's performance and the price because of the cost constraints we have in our budget. Thus, there is no one size fits all. We need to have an interplay and an optimal setup across these various factors based on our, on our user requirements. So based on this knowledge and the understanding of the properties of the models, you can select your first initial two or three candidate models for your use case. And then how do we enhance these models to then build and develop our use case further? I'll hand it over to Aris to walk us through this. Thanks, Roy. So we have used these characteristics that trade off now in order to get the subset, as Roy said, of models. So let's say maybe three, four, five models that we want to further evaluate. Now we need to go back to our use case. We need to ask us the question, is this enough? Can we just use these models now in order uh, to build our chatbot? And in order to assess that, let's think about a couple of requirements which we might have, or the users of any company's chatbot might have. So first of all, we would certainly not like the chatbot to hallucinate, right? So we would like to infuse that chatbot with information out of the product catalog of any company, which might be a PDF of 20 or 30K pages, right? So we can ground the model with that information, and it doesn't hallucinate could be one requirement. Another requirement could be any company has marketing guidelines, including specific lingo, acronyms, and any, com any company wants the chatbot to speak that language. Or another requirement, we would like to build guardrails around that whole system. So the chatbot is not asking in a harmful manner and spits out explicit content. Now, with all of these requirements, and certainly many more in reality, it is pretty clear that we need to put a bit more sophistication into the model itself. In order to build a chatbot, we need to think about how we can enhance the capabilities of foundation models or the whole application around it. And there is a, luckily a couple of approaches for that, and we're going to walk you through them sequentially now. And I want to start with prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is probably something you have excessively done already, at least in an experimental setup, trying out new models. This is how it usually works. Now, prompt engineering is a technique that is trying to optimize the model input, which we call prompt, in order to maximize the model output, which we call response. It's a technique that is very model specific, so a prompt that works well with one model might not work well with another one. And there is a couple of you know, common patterns in prompt engineering that we have seen that work well. So few shot, for example, or recursive prompt engineering techniques like chain of thought or React. Now, the cool thing is we can also do something else with, else with prompt engineering. We can build these guardrails around the model. We can instruct the model in order to gain fine grade and strategic control in order how the model behaves. And with that, we can mitigate risks like harmful behavior. So we can really use prompt engineering in order to build these guardrails around our customer-facing chatbot for any company. I was speaking about experimental prompt engineering, and that probably all of you have done that excessively. Now, we are now in an enterprise setting, right? So we want to do it a bit more structured, a bit more you know, founded, and a bit more in a way that we can also automate it. And one approach to do that that I pretty much like, because it very, it's very similar to test-driven development, and I have a software engineering background, um, is the following. So you develop test cases that are representing the desired behavior of the model or the application. And don't forget your edge cases. It can be cumbersome. Nobody really likes to, want, uh, to write tests, but this is going to be exactly these edge cases where the model is harmful. You start with an initial prompt, and you throw it against the model. You get a response, and you run through the tests. And then you get first probably a performance that is very likely you know, over the bar you are desiring. You are refining the prompt. You're testing again. You're entering into an iterative cycle um, in that sense until you pass this bar. Usually, this is all tests are green. And then you end up with a polished prompt or prompt template that you, that you can share across your organization and use at scale. Now, we have seen how we can use prompt engineering to build guardrails around the model. Let's move on to the next requirement. 
let's think about how we can take these 10K, 20K documents and infuse them into our application. And you might say, you know, the new models, they have huge context windows, so just throw the whole document into the context and we are done. That's not a good approach um, out of a lot of different reasons. One reason being the cost. You pay per token in a lot of the cases, but also latency will suffer, memory requirements, and a lot more. We need to find a bit more sophisticated way to isolate you know, just the relevant information out of that 10, 20k pages, depending, dynamically depending on what the user is asking. And this is exactly what retrieval augmented generation as a dynamic prompt engineering technique is concerned with. How does it work? Well, we take the documents, our huge PDF, and um, we build a knowledge base based on that. And for that, we are slicing the document into smaller chunks that are digestible. We are using an embeddings model that is transforming you know, the content of these chunks into contextualized embeddings. This is numerical vectors. And we are storing that in a vector database that is forming our knowledge base as a backend. And we are storing them with the vectors as primary keys and with the text as properties. And this is something we do once. This is an ingestion process. Now, if a customer asks a question about a product on the chatbot, we take that question and we embed it into the same vector space with the same embeddings model. And now we can do a similarity search. So we compare the vector, the embedding of the question with every other chunk embedding. And we pick the three, five, seven. This is configurable. This is a hyperparameter. Most similar chunks to the model. And we give these chunks to the model together with the question. So the model has some kind of context, because we have the hypothesis that you know if the vectors are close enough, the probability is high that the answer to that question is actually in that chunk. And with that, we are getting not any answer that is that might be halluc hallucination. We are getting actually a grounded answer that to a very high probability is correct. Now, you might ask yourself, is this complex to build? Or I guess many of you have already built something like that with open source and Langchain or other libraries. And you have done the ingestion. And then you think about, OK, so now a document changed. How do I need to update my vector database? And all the plumbing, and then things are not working. Is there not a, a simpler approach to do that? And in fact, there is a simpler approach to do that. Knowledge bases for Amazon Bedrock. This is a fully managed approach for Rack. You can securely connect your data sources to your foundation model in order to improve accuracy by, as we said, grounding responses. It's end-to-end -end fully managed, the workflow, including uh, the ingestion, the retrieval, and the prompt augmentation. And you even get citations, meaning that the chunks that are used to ground the model, we show them to you so it gets explainable. Um, and you actually know why the model answered in a specific way. Now let's get back to our use case. We have now solved the chatbot problem. Let's take that a bit further. Let's assume the customer has figured out which product to order. And now he wants uh, which product to choose. And now he wants to order it. So the old fashioned way would be to take out the phone, you know, and then call the sales support, and then they have a conversation. The sales support gives a bit more information. And then at some point, uh, the customer orders, and the sales uh, assistant is saving that in some kind of uh, order system. Now, that's old school. Why not automating that as well as part of that application? And this is actually what you can do with a concept called agents. How does it work? Well, let's look at the task. This is now a bit more complex than just pulling in information in a question answering based system, because this task might, in fact, you know, be comprised or can be decomposed into two subtasks. So you need to potentially pull in information to give a bit more information to the customer speaking to you or speaking to the virtual agent, while having a second step subsequently that is storing information in a push principle in an order management system or a database. So someone needs to take care uh, to decompose these tasks, to execute them in a sequential order, and to potentially pass output of the first step into the second step. And we can do that with LLMs. That's the great thing. Um, and as I said, we call that agents. Again, the same uh, question. 
is this complicated to build? Or maybe you have already built it. Um, and it's a lot of different components. We also have a great solution for that. Agents um, for Amazon Bedrock, it does exactly what we just discussed in a fully, fully managed ma manner for you. It decomposes tasks and orchestrates them. You can actually pull in information from data sources like RAG in a secure manner, but you can also execute actions. This is the pull, um, for example, interacting in a secure manner with APIs or enterprise applications. And the whole process that is behind it is not a black box. We are actually providing you a trace of what's happening behind the scenes of the chain of thought, as we call it. You can look into that for observability. Let's look into the console. Let's look into Amazon Bedrock, how easy it is to actually um, build such an agent. With agents for Amazon Bedrock, you can now create an agent, add knowledge bases, and action groups from within a single interface. Let's create a new agent that will assist us in authoring the next great fantasy novel. First, we need to give our agent a meaningful name. We'll use Anthropic's Claude V2 as the model for our agent. Next, we'll provide our agent with some instructions. In this case, we want our agent to be well-versed in fantasy lore to help us with our writer's block. Next, we can empower our agent with the ability to use APIs, granting them access to a wide range of tools and services. By specifying a Lambda function, our agent can get the latest comments from my blog. We can make our agent an even better fantasy writer by specifying a knowledge base with fantasy story quick starts. That's it. We can now prepare and test our agent. Cool. And we can obviously likewise apply that for you know the chatboard order system that we were aiming to develop, right? And it really works in under two minutes. That's great, right? Now, moving on, we have built guardrails around our application. We have ingested domain-specific knowledge. We have ingested the product information out of these huge PDFs. And we can now even order uh, different products in the system. Now, there is one thing missing that we had as a requirement. And that was the marketing guidelines, the lingo, the acronyms. How do we get that into our application? Now, as opposed to the first two approaches that were kind of tackling the prompt and the applic application around it, in this case, we really need to tackle the model itself. And we do that with a concept called fine-tuning. Fine-tuning is an approach that is taking a base model, a pre-trained base model, and is just training it a bit further with a smaller domain-specific data set. Smaller as compared to these terabytes of data that we would use to pre-train a model. And we can do that with unlabeled data, as Roy said. It's called pr continued pre-training. We can do that with supervised uh, fine-tuning that works with labeled data. And there is also other approaches. Now, you might think about, is foundation model training really something I want to do in my organization? It's really a bit of deep learning. I might have to do distributed training because the models are getting large. Well, even for that, we have a solution for you. We have Amazon Bedrock custom models, fully managed serverless approach to fine tune your models, either uh, continue pre-training with unlabeled data or supervised fine tuning with labeled data. You just put your data into S3, you point Bedrock to that data, and you kick off the training job. And with that, you can actually fine tuning, uh, fine -tune a lot of popular models on Amazon Bedrock. Now, once you have done the training, once you have deployed these models, these models work as any other model on Amazon Bedrock. You can use them through the playground, through the API, through the SDK, and harness all the benefits, the features you're having around in Amazon Bedrock. And a couple of weeks ago, another pretty cool feature was released, Amazon Bedrock custom model import. You can now import customized models, so really the model weights from models of popular open source architectures like Llama or Mistral into Amazon Bedrock. And this is now massive, right? So if we are speaking about model choice in Amazon Bedrock, it's a bit more than 30 models. Now with that, we are expanding that to an unlimited amount of models you can start that whole journey from. Because you can just fine tune your own model on SageMaker and import it or pick any fine tuned model from an open source model hub like Hugging Face. And again, once imported and uh, deployed, you can use these models as all other models in Bedrock and harness the full functionality. And this is how easy it works.
With the custom model import feature, you can bring your own custom models into Bedrock and use them seamlessly. First, we'll give our model a name. Then we can select our model from SageMaker, or in this case, import custom model weights from our S3 bucket. Finally, we need to set the roll access and click on import. That's it. We can now see our customized model in Bedrock. Once the model is imported, we can then test it in the playground. Cool. Looking forward to uh, what you will be building with your customized models on Amazon Bedrock. Now, we have looked into model characteristics, the first drill down into a couple or a handful of models that we want to further analyze, uh, analyze. We have now you know, aligned these models to our specific use case with several approaches. Now, what is missing is really a structured approach to compare them, right? And not just the experimental approach where a couple of people are prompting and somebody says, OK, that looks better than the other one. Really something that works at enterprise scale that is really grounded with data and that you can automate. And Roy is going to introduce you how you can do that very uh, easy on Amazon Bedrock. Thank you, Aris. So you have your use case, and you have experimented with various prompt engineering techniques. Based on the use case, you might go with a foundation model or fine tune the model to adapt it to your domain. And the next step is then to evaluate the model. This is a challenging task for various reasons. First, because there are no universal benchmarks for LLM evaluation. The existing benchmarks are task specific, and this is a very subjective area as well, because we don't have the definite metrics like we have for classical machine learning. Together with this, you have the challenge with the availability of quality data. The data needs to be diverse and representative of the task at hand. And to create this data can be a challenge and costly. And the other challenge is because it is a subjective area, you might need to integrate human in the loop evaluation. And it is a challenge on how to figure out how to have the human in the loop and scaling up the human in the loop evaluation based on the evaluation tasks. So how do we address these challenges? Based on the pain points from our customers, we came up with this evaluation workflow to guide you on how to run your model evaluation. We first check if we have labeled data for our use case. If we do, then it's great, because we can use this and look at our use case and define the metrics to evaluate the model. So based on, so based on our use case, do we have discrete outputs? An example is the sentiment analysis, where you have the positive or negative. Thus, if it's discrete outputs, we can use the classical machine learning like metrics, like accuracy, F1, score, recall, and so on. However, if this is not the case, then we have to use the task-specific like metrics. And an example here is with the summarization, where we look at the rouge, blue, and the similarity scores in order to evaluate the performance of our model. However, it is often the case that we do not have label data or you do not have label data. So how do you go about this? We again look at our use case A and understand, is this a subjective area where we need human input? And secondly, is this a critical use case where we also need the human input to evaluate the quality of the, of the model? Thus, we then run the evaluation with the human in the loop. And this is, or these are people who are domain experts or your workforce that can assess the quality of the model's outputs. We offer integration through the Amazon SageMaker like Grant Truth to uh, manage and streamline your workforce for the human in the loop evaluation. There is also a new approach that's emerging where you use LLMs to evaluate your model. So to use other LLMs as judges, and this enables you to automate this evaluation. However, it is still a new and emerging area of research that um, is under active development. Thus, through this streamlined workflow, you are able to address and have an evaluation workflow based on any use case that you have. So how can you apply this in Bedrock? We offer the model evaluation like capability in Bedrock, where you can run an evaluation job to compare the outputs of various models in order to select the right model for your use case. This enables you to bring your own data that will reside in S3 or use the inbuilt data sets to run the evaluation. And it supports text generation, text summarization, the question and answering, and text classification tasks at the moment. 
You can also customize the accuracy metrics for these tasks. So you can look at the accuracy, the robustness, and other like type of metrics that are supported by the evaluation toolkit. You can run an automatic evaluation job um, by using your data set, or you can also integrate with the human in the loop through the SageMaker like ground truth feature that is available in the evaluation toolkit. And with all this functionality, it enables you to quickly run the evaluation jobs and get faster results to assess the performance of the models and select the, and select the right model for your use case. So let's see this in action. Amazon Bedrock's model evaluation tool makes it easier to identify the optimal model for your use case. We simply select our candidate model for evaluation. In this case, we'll evaluate Titan Text Express. Then we set our task type, general text generation performance. Next, we'll specify our evaluation metrics. For this project, we're most interested in accuracy and robustness. For each metric, we can choose from the built-in datasets, or we can provide our own dataset stored in S3. Let's go with the built-in datasets. Next, we need to define the S3 bucket, where the evaluation results will be stored. Finally, we need to set the service role to allow Bedrock to upload data to the S3 bucket. Let's run the evaluation and check out our results. For accuracy, the model scored a 0.21, which means the model output scored low on accuracy. For robustness, the model was scored against three different datasets to compare how consistent it performed on slight changes to input prompts. The model scored very well in Wikitext 2, with a score of 0.968, and lower in the others it's never been easier to choose the right model for your use case. Right, how awesome is that, right? It really simplifies the evaluation workflow, enabling you to quickly get your models results and the performance results. So based on this, all the capabilities that we've seen today, they need to operate in a private and secure cloud environment, which is a key concern for our customers. Thus, this is why Bedrock was built and designed with enterprise-grade security features, and this means that your data is not used to train any of the models and is not shared with the model providers. And together with this, the data is always encrypted when in transit or at rest, and the data will only reside in the region where the API call is made, thus ensuring that the whole environment is private and secure. To recap, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today around how to evaluate and select the right model for your use case and also the various capabilities in Bedrock to enhance the capabilities of the model. And we have seen how with Bedrock you can quickly scale from your POCs to, to put your application into production. And together with this, through the wide choice of foundation like models that are available, you can easily invoke them through the simple API call to integrate into your application. You can also, through the knowledge base, easily bring your company data for RAG workflow. And in the cases where prompt engineering or RAG do not suffice, you can customize the models by fine-tuning them or importing your own custom models. We've also seen how agents simplify the task orchestration for our workflows. And lastly, we've seen how this operates in a secure and private cloud environment. Thus, we are excited and we look forward to seeing the applications that you will build on top of this. And thank you very much for the time today. It was a pleasure to present this session. Yeah.